Welcome back to Between the Sharks. Today, oh. stink bug. Today, we've got to start making this cowl better. It's really bad. On the last episode, we braced it so it's at least kind of square-ish in a unit. Now, we've got to start addressing all of the holes. So, I guess we're just going to take it one section at a time. May as well start with some of the worst, which is... Yeah, that's not good. It turns out that a lot of this metal, it has a skim coat of Bondo kind of on it under all this paint, but it's not as bad as it first appeared. However, plenty of rain got in through these holes, which hold the windshield stanchions, snuck behind the actual metal brace that goes in right here and rotted it out. And then one or two Bubba's that owned this before me packed it with Bondo. And then move on to maybe this hole, or this hole, or this hole, or these holes, or this hole, or this problem, or this hole. You see the point here? For all intent and purpose, this cowl is junk. But we're gonna fix it, we're gonna run it. Is it gonna be perfect? No. Nope. Nope. Is it gonna be alright? Yeah, sure. Maybe? I don't know. We'll try it. Here we go. We are going to start this portion of our investigative journey with this tired old flat wheel to do some exploratory surgery. So we've got at least like an eighth inch of Bondo in this section here. As much as I wanted to leave this texture, that's just not gonna fly. I think I got to, I think I should take this cowl outside and just start hitting all the bad spots and we'll do all of our sad discovery kind of at once and it'll keep the dust more out of the garage because there's gonna be a lot. Time to bring you guys in. Actually, we have a lot of good news here. This is actually in really, really good shape. That layer of Bondo was put there because I guess when they had originally done the patch, they used a piece of galvanized sheet metal and then riveted it. And the only way to make that smooth was to build up a big, thick layer of Bondo and smooth it out. Don't do that. Pop rivets and galvanized and Bondo. Uh, it just... Uh... Doesn't work, doesn't last. So this is actually a lot of really solid Henry Ford steel in there. I've just been using these worn out flap discs and if, as you can see, they're not really digging into the metal. There's not enough meat left on it. They're just knocking the Bondo off the top. Now granted, we've got some issues, but nothing we can't solve. All things considered, that could have been way worse. I think the thing to do while I have it outside is just just give it hell. I'm gonna go ahead and take the whole layer of Bondo off and see what holes we have, and I'll see you guys in a few minutes. Well, let's take a look at what we got. This is also in remarkably good shape. All of this Bondo down here was just for that bad patch that was riveted on. Here's what we got and what we kind of expected. Big old Bondo hole, hole, hole. So we're gonna have to make a patch in here. Maybe we can salvage some of this. And I don't know, that's kind of a mess. We got a ton of holes along the front of this, I don't know, above the dash piece. We got some Swiss cheesification going on here, some Swiss cheesification going on here. And let's uh, cruise around to the other side. This is also some, you know, bad news, kind of as we expected. We'll have to make a patch in here. But 
you know, it's one of those things. Still, 100 years old. I was dreading doing that, but I'm really glad that I did it. That only took about 25 minutes, maybe a half an hour, a couple of grinding wheel flat disc things, and I'm covered in dust, but whatever, that's just how it goes. But it's kind of cool to see, as the actual Henry Ford metal was sort of revealing itself yet again, it's one of the cool things about hot rods, you know? It, at some point, this was a brand new car, maybe at a dealership, maybe ordered on credit, you know, maybe on a layaway like Ford used to do, but somebody put out their money to buy this brand new in 1926 or 27. And when you let your mind wander, it could have been their first car, it could have been the first car ever owned by that entire family in the history of that family because it's a Model T. And progressively, you know, it changed hands. And unfortunately, I'm sure the first owners had great pride in this thing. And then it, you know, didn't get to retire into a barn. Eventually it just moved along, moved along, had bad repairs done to it, got left outside, got hit by a tree, kind of got rusted away and left it for dead. The guy that I bought this from didn't even want it. He got it for free with a 50s Renault that he wanted and just to sweeten the deal, he got this so he could sell it off. I dig it. And now, now we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna put it back on the road again. It reminds me of Susie the Little Blue Coop. You know, if you never saw that cartoon, it essentially follows the life of a car, Susie the Little Blue Coupe, where somebody lusts after it at the dealership, car gets purchased, eventually the car gets sold as a used car, the person that gets it next doesn't love it as much, it gets stolen, gets banged up, ends up in a junkyard, until some kid goes and buys it and turns it into a hot rod. So, maybe we'll be calling her Susie. Anyway, let's, let's make it better now. So this part can be pretty tricky whether you have patch panels or you don't. We don't. So I'm trying to figure out how to approach these in, you know, bite-sized chunks. I got this marked. I think this is going to be my first patch. Uh, the reason I'm going so far over this way, which I'm, you know, a little hesitant about, but I've got a bracket in here that goes two inches. So this leaves me one full inch. What that inch will allow me to do is put some clamps in here and also be able to get a hammer and dolly in in case I really screw up. The other option would be just to cut it right here, which I'm still cogitating. But then I really can't clamp it. Changing my mind already. Let's see, what do I really need? I really only need an inch and a half. Ugh. Maybe that's what we'll do. Ooh. That's how you can tell, it's real tricky. I'm still going back and forth. Whatever we do over here, if it works, we'll mimic it on the other side. If, I, if it doesn't work, then well, we won't do that again. So this is actually holding its shape quite nicely. That's really, really in good shape. So let's make a little patch that goes here and uh, get her put in. So there's lots of methods to make patterns and templates for patches, but when you're just doing some general tiny little hole begones, that's actually gonna be, <laughs> this is gonna be probably too good. Okay, well that just turns out. But uh, on the edges here, the guy just rubs his fingernail. You know, now we got some marks. We can enforce that with some sharpitude. And then if we go, you know, 
stick that onto a piece of sheet metal, you sort of have a pattern there. All right, gang, first piece in. I've just got it taped in with a piece of green gaff tape. I'm gonna grab the welder, tack it, move on with our lives. One down, two jillion more to go. All right, I'm gonna see if I can actually chase this down with the welder, and that'll make this the next big patch. Um, I really can't make it worse, so if I booger it up, I just cut it out. Right now, I've got the wire speed cranked way up, but I've also got the heat cranked way up, so let me see if that's a mistake. So when you're doing this, you definitely want the wire speed a little higher than you normally would, um, and you just aim for the last weld you just did, and that's gonna build up the thickest. All right, let's grind it down. So sometimes it feels like you can chase those around forever, because you keep hitting pockets of thin metal and it blows out or whatever, but really the alternative is either a much larger patch that encompasses all of this, or trying to do a tiny patch, which has a ton of crazy welding. The simple reality is, I don't know if you guys can see this, but this metal does have a lot of pits on this end, and I'm kind of okay with that, but that means some thin metal. So, you know, again, everything needs to be seen through the lens of what the final product is. I'm trying to replace as little of the sheet metal as possible because the pitting is part of the age. If this was gonna be any kind of showier finish than this, then uh, we'd, have, we'd be doing this a little bit differently. Probably cutting in a little more to the good metal, or really, we'd just be back burnering this cowl and working with a better one to get that product and then save this cowl for a project like this. All right, we're gonna call that a success. That's probably as large as I'd try to chase down. I say that now, but you know, we'll get this next. Just kidding. Uh, this will be a patch, we'll figure that out. Moving along. I know what you guys are thinking. This guy's got a table that's almost semi-professional. This is one of those situations where it's probably better to start with a pattern and start building a patch before we cut this out. So let's do that. This is one of many methods. Instant pattern. We are now stuck onto a piece of sheet metal. Just for good measure, go ahead and mark this in case our tape comes off. But that's our general shape of our patch. There we go. Got our Sharpie registration marks from our tape here. You can just mark kind of the edge of the door. Well, the edge of the break here. But now I think we're safe to go ahead and zip this out. 
and we'll slowly work towards this to figure out how to make it fit close. All right, we're close, but we don't quite fit. So our two options are take more out up here or take more out of our patch. All right, so before we go too much further, let's take a look at this. And one of the reasons this type of thing, A, can be a little intimidating, and B, is lesser seen on the YouTubes, is it can be a little trickier to get it right to where you like grind it and it looks super sexy or whatever. And that is because we've got a huge bracket behind most of this patch. That means we can't really get hammer and dolly behind here to flatten it out as we go. Um, but don't fret guys, we'll get her done. All right, now we're cooking. One of the tricks is we don't really have anything to clamp to. All right, so we've got the Lincoln Easy Mig 140, our little 110 machine, and that's all we're gonna use for this patch. We're fitting absolute best down here, so that's where we're gonna start. actually pushed it in just a little bit. You can do better than that. We're bound up just a fuzz here, so I'm gonna grab the cutting wheel and just ease that edge. Something like that, guys, that's really an ideal gap anyway. If you're super tight, the filler metal has nowhere to go which is kind of a thing that needs to happen for any sort of MIG welding operation. All right, let's uh, continue. We're basically just making it fit, tapping it with a hammer, prying it with a screwdriver, whatever we need to do. So we're just working around just like every other video about welding in a panel, you know, trying not to get too much heat in any one place. I know it's super ugly right now, just bear with me. Let's see how this works. <laughs> so this is the stuff that basically nobody ever shows or wants you to see. This looks like Fido's hind end. I know that it does. And I'm not proud of this. This is a lot of booger weld and caterpillar stuff and all whatever. Uh, we've definitely hit pockets of little bits of Bondo dust that's in the pores of this metal around the edge. We've definitely hit some thin stuff and blown through that and gotten, you know, some contamination in the welds or whatever. But just wait, here's, you know, the magical transformation. Let's, let's hit it with a grinder and see what we really got after all of this ugliness that no one shows you. Let's go ahead and take a flat wheel to it, which is the ultimate secret to internet metal finish. And then take a look at how we really did and assess. Let's, let's just, let's pretend our egos aren't involved, right? We've got a couple little pinholes we'll fill in just a moment, but realistically, we just 110 MIG welded this in. We didn't need to sandblast it. We didn't need to spend hours fitting this patch. We didn't need a break. We didn't need a shaper stretcher. We didn't need an English wheel. We just, we just made a patch. Now, I don't care how nice it looks, Unless you're like Marcel Delay or whatever, and you're trying to do metal finish work, even the stuff that looks super polished on the internet 
has a little bit of a wave to it. So if you wanted a show car paint job over that and you weren't going for metal finish as your final look, you're getting a skin coat of some kind of filler. Lead, Bondo, I don't like, it. be as old school as you want. But if I run it this way, maybe I can bring you in here to show you my gap down here. This, this piece also flares out, but right here, maybe, I need maybe a 30 second of filler right in this general area. I mean, that gap is so small, it's hard to even get you in here. And remember, this is on a panel we can't get behind a hammer and dolly. Like this is just, this is, this is just how we did it because there's a big brace back here. But this is what most of you have at home or what you're gonna invest in. So this is what I'm trying to show you how to use. Just because this looked terrible a few minutes ago, doesn't mean you did it wrong. Know what I'm saying? Very few people have addressed how to deal with stuff like this or these pinholes up on the top. This is not big enough for me to try to patch and we're under this windshield stanchion bracket. But that doesn't mean I'm gonna leave it. So I'm gonna show you a technique that's gonna look ugly and embarrassing, but it's gonna turn out as well as this. And uh, it's gonna make our car more better. So this is how to chase down cracks and pinholes. They're basically the same function. Let's dive in. So right in here, we've got a stress crack and a hole. So the metal has gotten thin enough that it is actually rotted away here and then stress fractured out from all of the thousands of things that have happened to this poor car over its lifetime. So basically we're going to fill it just with the MIG welder. That's it. The trick is you want to aim your welder at the thickest point and then you are going to slowly build back onto that weld. So if the tip of our marker is our electrode, our wire, this is my thickest part because I actually have a little bit of weld here. So I'm going to zap this and then at this angle and zap it again and zap it again and zap it again and zap it again until I've bridged this gap. So it's going to be zap. Let it cool, zap, let it cool, zap, let it cool, zap, let it cool. Then once I bridge this gap, I can start working out. Here goes nothing. Remember to find yourself a good ground. Super helpful. And if you can, because you don't want to make the metal any thinner than it already is, but if you can hit it with a grinder real quick, get some shiny stuff going, it'll help you out. You don't want to go easy on that, because remember, the issue you're dealing with is thin metal already. Here we are again, with one big, ugly, caterpillar-looking booger weld. But, you know, let's take old Grindy McGrinderson to it and see how we did. Not bad, right? So now we've just filled a crack slash hole just with a MIG welder. We put in a small patch. This is really all I wanted to show you. You know how bad that looked. You know how bad this looked. That's the way to do it. It's tricky with these old cars. Like, yeah, you can be a great metal shaper and make a new one of these, but I'm looking to, to fix this one, you know, because it's... To me, it's the authentic piece I have in my hands. So there we go, we fixed two small holes. We've got a thousand little holes to chase down and I'm gonna do it just like this. I hope this was helpful. I know it's not super sexy. Um, that's why you don't see it that much, but really it's an incredibly useful way to do things. And I just kind of wanted to put it out there in the world because I think anybody that's working on these is doing this. They're just not really showing it as much because well, it looks like you don't know what you're doing. It's okay. If you do, filling a hole with a MIG welder or a TIG welder, it's, you know, just add filler metal. It's fine. Cheers. On that note, we'll see you next time. I'm going to continue on this cowl and see if we can get her back on our 27 Ford. Thanks for watching, as always.